Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Comintech Data Hub. My name is Vladimir, and I'm part of the uh, Comintech team. Uh, before we begin today, I'd like to thank uh, the Autonomous Vehicle Innovation Network for funding this uh, regional technology development site delivered on behalf of the government of Ontario through the Ontario Centers of Excellence, allowing Open3D Map to be launched. And um, thanks to our partners, uh, we also have some great uh, data-focused services that uh, your companies can leverage whenever needed. Uh, given today's uh, discussion around mapping, please know that you can always reach out to us if you need help and coaching in regards to uh, anything related to spatial data, whether it be uh, GIS software development, remote sensing, spatial analytics, uh, and geomatics. And uh, with that said, I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, which is uh, Bill Singleton. Bill is the VP of Sales at Ecopia Tech and is responsible for engaging with uh, geospatial analytics uh, partners to find new ways of combining vector-based maps with alternate data sets to help public entities um, better understand and improve their communities. Everyone, please welcome Bill Singleton. Hello, can everybody hear me? Wonderful. Thank you everybody for taking the time to show up. It's a great, uh, it's a great crowd that we have here and then we've got everybody online. Um, my name is Bill Singleton, as I mentioned. Um, I've been with Acopia now for about four and a half years of the six years that we've been in existence. Uh, I'm joined here by the lovely Emily Jackson Bauer, um, who is, uh, who's from the Kitchener-Waterloo area, uh, Kitchener area, will be here after the presentation to answer any questions that you might have, but we're really excited to have the opportunity here to come back and to discuss all the success that we're having and all the support that we've received from this area through a number of different, uh, through a, num a number of different institutions and accelerator centers. Um, it's great to be able to come back here and uh, give you guys a little bit of a taste on some of the success that we've had and how this, uh, basically how this entire environment and community has been growing. So Acopia.ai, just to give you a little bit of a background of our organization, uh, we initially started potentially as a software, but we actually converted to being a data service. Um, and really, the main problem that we had distinguished was that there was so much imagery that was coming online from a number of different sources. Um, so we have a number of different satellite partners. We are working with street view vendors. We're working with aerial providers. There's also all these new drone organizations that are coming out there. And there was all these pixels that were coming onto the marketplace. And there just wasn't enough hands for people to be able to go in there and to review all of this great data that was being created to understand what was going on in communities all around the world. Uh, typically, what they were doing in the past was using humans and just throwing tens of thousands of man hours at this to create some of the maps that you know that you know and use today. And so, what our organizer did actually, uh, his uh, PhD research was out of the University of Waterloo. Um, and so, what we did was he had created a, a method to be able to review all of these pixels and to identify important features. Um, and it, the system is extraordinarily flexible to be able to sort of look at many different kinds of things that are happening and changing in the environment. And so in order to do this, what we actually de developed was a system that uses uh, deep learning in order to extract important information at, at huge continental scales. One of the first features that we actually started to look at, which we recognized was very difficult to uh, extract, was building footprints. Um, typically, people had to be used in order to draw these because there were so many differences in variation of color, texture, shape, uh, depending on wherever you are in the world. It was very difficult to extract these kinds of highly geometric features. And so actually, one of our first big wins was working with the Australian government. Uh, this is back when we were working in the Accelerator Center uh, in the, uh, just down the street. And uh, we started to have a lot of success working with our satellite partners. And so how did we do it? 
we actually created a system that uses deep learning, but it's actually a semi-automated system. Uh, extracting information from maps is actually incredibly difficult. There's a, lot of different, there's a lot of different shapes, sizes, as I mentioned, and textures. There's a lot of ambiguity in different kinds of features. And so really, just to be able to throw automation at this problem really doesn't get you to an idea of creating a very solid map that can be used for a number of different verticals. Um, typically, the solutions that were in the marketplace today there's automation software that sort of does a, a general nebulous job of doing a detection, maybe understanding there might be a few features here, but you really can't do any sort of further analysis on those, uh, on those kind of maps. And so what we wanted to do was we created a system where we actually are including humans in the system so that we can cr create a very a high quality training sample so that we can actually continue to improve upon our system as we get more projects. So when we started with our Australian project, uh, we started doing a, fuck, a, a few uh, local communities, and then we were able to scale that to be able to cover seven million square kilometers of the entire continent in a few short months. And so that's really what our first big win was, and we recognized we can, if we can extract building footprints, we can extract many different kinds of features all over the globe. And so that's what we've started to expand to do many different other kinds of things, to create high definition maps all over the world. So initially we got our start doing buildings, which is helpful for governments and insurance organizations. But then what we've started to expand to is doing road networks, doing natural features, it's trying to help out in a number of different areas. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, one, of, one of our next big wins was actually helping with insurance organizations. Um, after a big disaster, um, everybody gets evacuated from an area. And really what ends up happening is nobody gets back into the area to start the claims process for potentially a week or two. And so insurance companies have no idea how they can be helping to resource these areas. Um, so you end up having this long lag time in between when a disaster occurs and being able to get help to the most vulnerable, situ to the most vulnerable citizens of those areas. And so what we were able to do is, after major events, we worked with the Fort McMurray fire, uh, we, worked, uh, we worked with a lot of the major hurricanes that now take place in the United States. Um, we can help uh, these organizations, both the government and insurance organizations, understand how they can help better those communities um, before people even return home. Um, one of the other ways that we're actually working is building high using our high definition maps is in the telecommunications industry. So now with the advent of 5G, uh, it's a little bit of a finicky uh, bandwidth where you really need to have line of sight um, to all of the devices that you're supporting. There's a tremendous amount of throughput, but really you, really, you need to have more access points all around, um, all around your community. So line of sight is very important. So you really need to have a very thorough understanding of your three-dimensional space that you're going to be supporting. And so that's where a lot of our maps are actually being used today as well, is being able to understand where all of the buildings are, how high they are, where all the vegetation is, what kind of vegetation is there, so that you can have an understanding of how we can support people as they're using their video-ready endpoints. So, we've been having a lot of success creating HD maps uh, all over the globe, and uh, I'd say going back to about 2018, we had the opportunity uh, to start partnering with the AVEN program. Um, and so what we wanted to do was be able to create a very high definition map so that we could start supporting autonomous vehicles. Uh, one of the issues right now today, a lot of people have experimented using OSM, uh, open street maps. Now these kind of platforms are created by a thousand different contributors using a thousand different data sources. And so what you end up having is a situation where you have a map that is great for enthusiasts and maybe a little bit of academia, but really when you have to depend on having one-ton trucks being transport, transporting very high valuable materials all around, the, all around your communities, it really doesn't have, that kind, of, uh, really doesn't have that, that kind of accuracy that you need to depend upon. And so what we wanted to do was we started creating these maps that have all of these different features that people can use so that they can better understand their communities. Now, um, these maps can be reused for a number of different governmental purposes. I mean, one of the, one of the most recent projects that we did um, was actually working with um, uh, a few local state governments 
in helping them understand how their pedestrians are moving from one spot to another. So really having an understanding of bike lanes, uh, sidewalks, a number of different other features. Other things that we've also added um, are working with building footprints, address points, parking lots. One of the biggest issues when you're trying to create uh, a system where people can understand how, to, how they, transport, uh, they transport themselves uh, among communities is understanding how to get from point A to point B. Um, so this is where you start using parking lots and uh, having an understanding where these uh, geocodes are. <coughs> oh, sorry. So anyway, going to the map that we're actually creating for uh, the Waterloo region, there's four kinds of APIs that we're going to be actually adding to our map that are critical so that you can have an understanding of how people can, uh, of how people can be transporting themselves using vehicles. The first one that we're going to be using, sorry, it's just one slide back, uh, is a geocoding API. So one thing you might not realize when working with uh, map platforms like um, Google or Uber, we've all had this experience where you're, you're going to a specific location and you actually don't end up where you think you're going to be. And that's because geocoding is actually a very difficult task. And so what Acopia is going to be building actually on a North American basis, and we're, we're starting this in Waterloo, is actually a structured-based geo, geocode system where every geocode or address is given a specific lat long. So you can know the exact location of where you need to be doing deliveries or, where, or how you can have an autonomous vehicle go from point A to point B. The next API is a localization API. So this is actually critical when um, you're trying to under, um, sorry, I'm one slide ahead here, is a routing API. And so in this piece, um, what you really need to understand is you have your lat longs from point A and point B, um, and so now you need to understand the road network of how you need to traverse this area um, in the most optimal way possible. And so then the last piece is the localization, or sorry, the third piece is the localization API. And so you can see here, um, so you need to have an understand uh, how, you, how you can be able to add, uh, where you are on the mapping platform. So when you're traveling from point A to point B on the road network, which lane are you in? So you have to have an understanding so that you can be able to make the correct left and right turn lanes. And then in the last piece is uh, basically our perception API. Now, the way that we see the world, we want to try to put everything in the map before, um, before the perception API actually needs to do its work. The more, the more things, the more information that we can put into the map, the less we have to rely on the perception API. So the perception API, we really want to focus on dynamic aspects of the map so that it's focusing on vehicles and people versus having to focus on trying to understand where traffic lights are that are more, uh, uh, that are more stagnant. So um, for the HD map that we've created, uh, who can be using this? So this is, this is really where we want to be including the community and all of this group here. Um, so really what we want to have you guys, we want all SMEs and academia to be able to access our map so that you guys can give us feedback and we can provide you with this base level map so that we can make all of your applications much more robust. So we really want to get this feedback from, from the crowd here. Uh, whatever applications that you may be developing, we're actually working very closely with Moro and the Avon community. Um, we have a, a questionnaire that we've actually put out, and if there is any information that you want us to build into our platform, um, or if you do have any questions, please work directly with Moro because um, we're happy to be able to include this as we continue our process um, with building this out. Absolutely. What is Subject matter expert. So depending on how you, if you guys really do need map data, we're, we're small to medium oh, small, sorry, <laughs> small to medium enterprise, sorry. Uh, so small to medium enterprise, so small businesses like yourselves, and also um, academia, that's where I got the small subject matter expert. Um, so yes, we're, we want to make this as available as possible. 
So in terms of what we've done so far, um, we have collected all the street view for the Waterloo region. Um, we've collected aerial region for the, we've collected aerial imagery for the, um, all of the area as well. We have worked very closely with the local government in order to collect all the necessary address and POI information. Um, and we have all of our algorithms, all of our algorithms are already have been developed uh, for the work that we've done previously for federal governments around the world. Um, and so now really what we're doing is just going through that imagery and creating these HD vector maps right now. Um, right now our first deliverable is 5% of the Waterloo region, uh, which is due in March 2020. Uh, and again, we're very open to collecting all of the feedback that your teams might have so that we can build a map that will support as many applications as possible. So I wanted, just to, to, I wanted to take some time here to open up actually what we've built so far. And then we can ask any questions that you might have. So this is, let me just maximize this. So this will give you an, a perspective of what we're going to be building over the entire region. Um, and so this is going to be giving you all the information. This is going to be the base information that people are starting to build on top of. And so when I was talking earlier about all the different verticals, uh, I mean, this is, this is what they want to put into their models so that they can start creating higher order applications um, to help communities and to help the citizens within those communities. So as you can see, it's, like a, it's, a, it's a much more thorough map than what you're typically used to um, with Mapbox and some of the other providers out there um, that provide uh, consumer-grade uh, consumer mapping products. Uh, really what we want to include is everything we possibly can, not just to help the autonomous vehicle community, but to really be helping insurance, um, academia, uh, real estate, everything else. So to give you just an example, um, the geocoded API that I had talked about. Um, so this is the first critical step for you to have an understanding of where am I starting and where am I going. So we can put an address in the top left corner here. And you'll see that this will, it, it actually pops up to the actual sort of front door of where that location is. So you have an understanding of how you can traverse right to the, um, where the car needs to go in order to deliver or to pick up from that, from that area. And so you can see here, I actually just want to give you just a sense of the accuracy of the map. So I can actually play with the, opa the opacity here. And so even with differences in vegetation um, uh, and blockages, we're able to extract very high quality geometry, like you'll notice here. Um, even when trees are blocking out some of the features, we're able to do this so that you can have an understanding of where everything is in the community. And so then what I wanted to do is I want to show you. So what we're doing in order to create this map is we're not, we're not only using aerial imagery, uh, but we're also mixing it with street view. And the importance there is, number one, there's more features that you can collect. All of the different traffic features that you look at, um, you, it, it tends to be very difficult to identify things like traffic lights and traffic signs when you're taking photos from, from a plane. And so what we want to do is be able to mix street view imagery uh, with the, uh, the overhead view so that we can ensure that we not only have the exact pinpoint location of that, of that item, but also so we can understand what that item is, whether it's a stop sign, whether it's a yield sign, uh, whether it's a crosswalk sign. So that's where we actually, for every, single, for every single street in this area, we also have the street view for that area. So similar to some of the other platforms that you have used, um, we, we've been able to go through, extract many different kinds of features, um, but really we're trying to add all the, all the important traffic features like lane, in, lane detail, stop lines, crosswalks, so that autonomous vehicles can actually make the correct decisions when they're, when they're in transport. And so then we're still developing this right now. Um, but like I mentioned, so the next thing that you have is uh, you've got your routing API. So the routing API is really just trying to optimize your, your best locations. Once, now that we have geocoded everything, our routing API will be able to give you your best route to that location. And then the localization API is essentially letting you know where on the street are you. So you really want to have a better, you really want to have a strong understanding um, 
that you are in the right lane, the left lane, et cetera. And just to, just to sort of wrap it up again, the last piece is that perception API. The more that we can put into this map now, the less that a vehicle has to determine and make decisions on at the time. So there are some people that are trying to create these kind of maps with a bare minimum amount of information um, created up front. And what that then what that forces is it forces the sensors of the car and the control systems and the intelligence of the car to make more decisions, um, to make more decisions and to understand more things while they're traveling at, ver at top speed. So really the, the way that we imagine the future is let's try to build in as much as possible into this base map, especially items that don't change uh, regularly. We'll keep the map up to date on a biannual or annual basis. And then that way the car only has to focus on our people crossing the street. How many cars are within my bubble? And so then that way they can make a better, the, there's less decision making that has to happen uh, in order to reduce mistakes. So I wanted to take a quick pause there and see if there's any questions, whether, whether it's on the AVEN program, whether it's things that we can help support, how we create these maps, or other industries that we're potentially working in. And sorry, I got a little bit, <laughs> got a little bit confused there at, at the beginning. All right, I'm just gonna pass uh, the catch box over to you. Uh, I'm interested to know how you keep uh, the map information updated. Let's say you get the information about the street configuration on a stop sign, and let's say uh, something happens and the car runs the stop sign down. So then if an uh, autonomous vehicle comes there on the intersection, there is no stop sign. So it uses your information that should be a stop sign or it reads the, the real life uh, image and make a mistake because the sign is down. So the way that it would be right now is based on the base map, because we're trying to, again, like I mentioned, put as much into the base mapping platform as possible, um, into, the, into the base information. Um, there is something to be said about the, what kind of feedback loop will occur with the perception API. Um, right now, a lot of, there is a lot of vendors out there who are trying to have everything understand it and be sending a lot of information back and forth. Um, we don't think that that is really the way to, to do it. Whereas if, if you have that base map and you actually worked out the feedback loop with the perception API, you could actually fix that based on it just understanding one little piece has changed versus trying to understand everything and then what is the situation today versus tomorrow versus the next day. So I think that would come down to the feedback loop that you have with uh, the perception API. All right. Hi, uh, this is Mo from Safe Ground. Uh, what kind of uh, information layers have been added so far to the map? And are there any specific information uh, you guys are looking forward to integrate into the, uh, the map? Thanks. Great question. So I, I think the last part of your question is that's where the, the survey would potentially come into play. I don't know particularly what kind of applications you guys are creating, but we're always open to try to understand what would be the most important kinds of things that you guys are looking for. We have customers in several different verticals who always want us to look at different things, and so we're always trying to add to our map. We've got some basic features here. This is uh, in terms of what the map will look like right now. I just close that down. Right now, these, these are the main features on these two slides that we're responsible for. But we will always want to have an understanding of what kind of, um, what kind of applications you guys are building so that we can have a better understanding of how we should be building these in the future. So if you look at these, I think we're, we're sort of at, uh, I think it's like 15-ish. One, two, three, yeah, six. Yeah, it's about, it's about 13 or 14, but most are transportation related. So we can add other things um, in future iterations. We just want to have an understanding of what would be the most valuable for your teams. Uh, over here, yeah. Uh, this is uh, Moro from Commutech. Um, I'm overseeing uh, the project here at OpenHD Maps. Uh, and one of the, just to uh, append to, to Bill's comment there is, in general, the idea of this whole project is a cooperative model to kind of really grow the ecosystem. 
So there will be open layers above these maps. So uh, Acopia has been an amazing partner here doing all, a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of building the platform and, and the base layers and the APIs. Uh, but just to put the call out to the community here as well is that for participants, um, you could access this information if you're a, a small to medium sized enterprise at no cost. The idea being that you can contribute data at these other layers as well and have this as a general location where you can see what others in the ecosystem are working on and whether you can benefit from their data and vice versa. Um, so this is really trying to foster that very innovative environment where a lot of collaboration can happen. So uh, we really, there's been great work done by Acopi here to kind of really get that, uh, get everything started and up and going, but we're really looking uh, from the overall AVEN project to get uh, a lot of collaboration from uh, other uh, companies, and we have a number of programs and services to try and engage companies. So uh, if you have any questions regarding to that, uh, just don't hesitate to chat to me right after the session as well. So I just want to put that out there. Thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm not sure if I've missed them, but three questions. First, you mentioned that there will be an annual or biannual, or there might be an annual or biannual uh, update to the map. What about a live update for public transportation and parking spots? And when I say parking, three kinds of parking, street parking, parking lots, and private parkings. If you're talking about autonomous vehicles going in and out of private uh, parking uh, spots as well, the availability of street parking, et cetera, and uh, especially in, uh, I, I, you've mentioned the light rail uh, system as well, uh, having that integrated in, in live uh, feed to the system, as well as, for instance, the region during the winter and uh, snow clearing, et cetera. Uh, is that something that you would look for a partner to come up with the integration or what? Thanks. Hi. I'll run up to the front. Yeah, so what we're doing is really just creating the foundational layer. So we're not doing anything in terms of real-time updating. That is very much something that we hope a partner would come in and, and participate in. There's partnerships that have been uh, forged with Brist Synergies, for instance, who does real-time data analytics at traffic lights. Um, but what we're doing is really creating this foundation so that it's really high accuracy and then opening it up for other participants to come in and add in those additional layers. So in terms of the parking, um, your original question, we are creating that's one of the features that we will be extracting. So things like street parking, how many spots are available but we will not be doing things like how many are available at this present time. Um, so in terms of parking lots, same thing, how many parking spots are available, if they're all available, but we won't be doing real-time updating. So that, that foundational information will be available to whomever um, is, is interested in doing those real-time updates. I was wondering if uh, uh, <clears throat> the information that uh, is taken from the video camera uh, on a self-driving vehicle, is, is that um, uh, somehow uh, uh, curated uh, when it compares with the, the information from the, the maps? For example, there is this uh, well-known case of a machine learning attack when if you uh, do some gra graffiti on a stop sign, the deep learning uh, neural network might confuse the stop sign with an orange. Yeah, I mean, you do small changes to an image and you can attack the machine learning model, fooling it and, you know, it confuses the stop sign with an orange, yeah? So uh, I was wondering, uh, you know, the position of the stop signs can be uh, taken from the Ministry of Transportation. Here should be a sign, stop sign, regardless if it's present physically there or not. You know what I mean? Well, I, I think the advantage to that would be, and I, I mean, there's even, 
the Ministry of Transportation. I'm, even that data um, right now is, tends to need to be repaired, um, and that's where we are creating this base level map. But we have the capability, once we create the base level map, to double check everything. So that's where I think the strength of our system comes into play, is you're not gonna have something on the perception piece um, trying to have an understanding of what everything looks like today because you could have something that gets blocked out or maybe it's covered by snow or there's other things there. Whereas if we have the base map already created from uh, ideal conditions using multiple different sources of information, whether it be street view, whether it be aerial, um, we could even be using other sources in the future. Um, but what, if we create that base map in advance and then we double check everything, then really those kind of, those kind of errors should be avoided because you're not gonna have the car trying to understand that there is a stop sign there. The car will know that there is a stop sign there. Now to the first question, if that stop sign gets run over, that's a little bit of a trickier a problem because now you have a foundational, foundation, foundational piece of infrastructure that has been removed quickly. And so that's a little bit of a different, a different problem, but we'll also be working on that. Uh the information which you are feeding into the base map, how frequently it will be updated? Uh, that we're feeding into the base map? Yeah. Um, it, it's dependent on customer to customer, but for the AVEN, I think we're doing, yeah, yeah once uh, a year. No, how frequently it can be updated? Um, how frequently can it be updated? Yeah. I mean, if we're working with partners based on something like parking lots, I mean, we, we want to encourage other people to try to be feeding in other sources of data and real-time sources. I mean, I think that's a great application that got brought up there is we'll give you guys the base structure. There's a lot of work that goes into this and then we can have other partners who can come in and be adding other information onto it um, based on the requirements that, are requi that might be helpful. I don't know if you... Yeah, I mean, the updates can occur as often as we have imagery available to us, essentially. And there will be a function within the platform where if there is a new subdivision or a new street or some, where you can tag that as something that needs to be addressed by us um, to go in. And I was just gonna comment on the previous question around um, the updating and the confusion is that's why this particular um, map is, is not gonna be entirely open. The base map itself isn't an open map. So we're doing that so that those features are locked so that when you're adding on top of and contributing to, those base features and the core features on the map can't be easily altered. Um, and that's a big reason for us doing that. Yeah, and, and that kind of feeds into some of the, uh, as the overall project, the AVEN project for HD maps, is there will be a, a certain level of governance uh, to identify the process to take, uh, say, a, a discrepancy that's been identified by an SME that has an application to go in and collect information to see, find map maintenance kind of information. So it could be using information from municipalities for like building permits type information or from devices physically on vehicles that can flag issues. Um, again, Copia is uh, one of our key main partners, but uh, this could be a, a call for uh, projects in the future in the next year or so where map maintenance is going to be a challenge that may be a call out to the ecosystem to say, do you have technology that you think could be used to help flag or really deal with map maintenance? Because that is one of the big challenges in terms of keeping the map up to date. And how frequently that is required may depend on, it might be variable, it might be certain areas require higher updates, other areas less updates, versus a fixed kind of uh, schedule for updates. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions. The first one is how long does it take to create a base map for, uh, say, the Waterloo region? And uh, what other regions are you covering right now? And you said there are some insurance applications uh, already. Uh, so does that mean you already have a map that covers a lot of the North American areas? Or do you have plan to? Great, great question. Um, <laughs> Multi-part question there. Um, so we are building map content all over the globe right now. And so it depends on how many features that you're looking for. That's really will dictate the speed in which we can create uh, a map. Now, this is going to be one of our most thorough, most robust maps that we're creating. Um, so it's actually going to be taking a little bit longer than, than normal. Um, but if you can boil things down to a few of the most important features, like with insurance. So insurance, they're looking for change detection of things like roads, bridges, buildings. 
I mean, we can be covering, we're, sometimes we're covering tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of square kilometers in a month or two. Um, so there is, there are ways, especially with features that we originally got our start in. I mean, we've been working with building footprints ever since that first Australian project I talked about for four or five years ago. Um, so it, it does depend on the amount of features that we have and also the amount of data sources that we're using. So when we start to talk about traffic level features like stop signs, yield signs, and all those pieces, we actually have to mix street view imagery as well with the top down view. So if we're focusing just on aerial satellite imagery, um, we can be churning out very large areas very quickly. Um, when we start to get into more advanced use cases that require these sort of traffic, uh, traffic items, then we, we're planning on covering, like we mentioned here, I think it's like going over the next year and a half will be covered through the Waterloo area. And in terms of our plans, I mean, we want to be successful with this. We want to be covering all of the, I mean, if, we're, if we are successful here, we want to be starting to work and create these base maps for a lot of the even communities that have been brought on for the Ontario area. And so it really what we want to do is get the start here, give you guys the opportunity to get a head start in creating applications that might be very useful for this base map. And then we're really going to be pushing this out to communities across Ontario and then North America through our partners. Um, just wonder is the speed limit um, like school song or sometimes countryside will a different speed limit part of the map? Yes, yes. So um, that's, that's information that can be attributed into the road network. Um, so that's actually, a, it's basically a feature within the feature. It's part of the metadata of the polygon. So yeah, that will be included. That's an absolutely necessary aspect uh, for the autonomous vehicle use case. Um, so yes, that will be included. But that's just, that's another great example of additional data that has to be added into this base map, which makes this process a little bit more complicated versus us doing a continent-wide extraction of basic building footprints or road networks. Any more? All right, uh, what one thing makes you successful and what is making your product different? What one thing is different than uh, the other mappers? Absolutely. It's a great question. So uh, we didn't include a slide here, but re the, the best way to sort of summarize it is what other automation software is capable of doing uh, using pixelated data sets. And what you'll see is whether it, you're trying to, whether it's an on-prem solution software that you purchase from um, some of the other offers that are out there, to other data service providers um, who are just trying to do very large areas, is you really don't have a crisp like a crisp foundation, um, things like trees uh, and other items, like you, you could have streets where there's a lot of overhang of foliage and vegetation, and if you're just throwing some basic automation at it, it will have the road stop. It, it doesn't infer that that polygon or that feature actually continues. Part of our, part of our algorithms are actually trying to understand the context of pixels beside um, these areas, and so what we're really trying to understand is where do these features continue despite being blocked out? And really having our team go through and make sure that we have the highest level of results. So we really like to say that we have human level quality. Um, when you're working with civil engineers, when you're working with insurance organizations, you really can't have a map that is a bunch of sort of blotch, blotchy spots of where things could be. You can't do calculations on square footage or, or building volume. Um, and you really can't create sort of 3D models from that as well. So where we're, where we're trying to go is create high fidelity maps um, with the highest level of accuracy, despite being able to expand our uh, capacity to very, very large areas. So I think that's really where we separate ourselves, is having a, a, a laser focus on creating a high quality product. Um, because if you can create that base map at that, at that highest level, it can be reused for a number of different verticals. And so that's really where we're trying to get to, is create one map very well once that can be used by everybody. So, um, I have a question about the flexibility of the maps. Um, I mean, it can be very crowded. You have lots of details, trees and houses and roads and hydrants and so on. Um, I used to work with phase three maps and they offer layers, like you have a base street map, bare 
only strips and shapes, nothing more. And you can add uh, POI, like point of interest layers or hydrant layer, it depends on the application, what you are interested in. Instead of having a very detailed map from the beginning, mm -hmm. it was layered, stacked, and you so, can see only what you choose to. Yes, yeah, so that's exactly what we're doing here. So I, I, can, I can actually turn these layers on and off. So I can turn the building layer off. Like the, really what we're trying to do is separate everything into their individual categories. Um, it's not just one shape file that you're basically, shape file, geojson file, geodatabase file that you're turning on and off. Um, really want to make sure everything is separated out into their individual pieces. Um, that way you can actually be, some people are just interested in the buildings. Let's give them the buildings, right? Like there's, we really want to make sure that it doesn't get crowded, right? Like there, there is, we don't want to have to give all the information to everybody when really you're only looking for transportation network. So it, you can just see here, I mean, we can turn like the road center lines on and off. Yeah, and the buildings on and off. And so it's, we really want to try to separate everything into their individual components. Oh, wait, I'll, go, I'll come back. Cause. Are you uh, pulling in any elevation or joining any of the elevation data into that? For this, for this task, um, we really wanted to focus on the autonomous vehicle aspect of it and prove that we could do this out. So this is more focused on transportation features and then we've added natural and building features because they're necessary for the transportation of vehicles. Um, we are doing projects like that in other areas um, where we are either creating our own elevation data um, through stereo pairs or we're using LiDAR data to put on top of it. Um, there's a number of different ways that you can get to elevation responses, and each one of them have a different sort of price tag to them. Um, so it really does depend on the use case of what you're doing. Like, just, just like I mentioned with our telecommunications use case, uh, elevation is critical because they want to have an understanding of where do my access points go, how high do they need to be in order to cover the most people. So yes, we are doing stuff like that. I think for this particular initiative, um, we're just focused on the 2D features because, again, we want to get you guys a base map that will help with the transportation aspect, um, give you guys a very thorough look at this community, and then help you guys build on top of that. Because that's really what the main goal here is, let's get you guys very high quality two-dimensional data, and then let's get as many people involved as possible. But I'd love to talk to you about a specific use case that might require that. Ooh. Question. And it's a silly question. Uh, do you have like uh, layers for this, the state of the snows on the roads or uh, the leaves stick up? Yeah. What was the, no, so we, that, that's something that we had discussed. Um, I think that winter will obviously add changes there, but there's no plans at this point for that piece. Um, but that's, it's a good question that we can talk, talk about later. No, so Google, Google data is very closed down. Um, it's obviously something that they've worked very hard to create. Um, this is something where we want to build something from raw data that we have collected ourselves because then we have more options to help share and to work with it with the community. So I, I think that's our main objective is we want to create something. It's, we're going to create the highest level order product that we can. Uh, use the best, using the best geocodes that we can have to improve on those geocodes because sometimes uh, even geocodes from other providers can um, be inaccurate. So we want to try to create something that we have the control to work with you to, to build other applications on top of. So I, I think it's important that we, we sort of create that so that we have more control and we can freely be able to work with the community. Great. 
Sorry, folks. <laughs> All right, any more questions? So uh, this is a follow-on question, I, I think, on the Google Maps that you're talking about, right? I was thinking since the beginning, like how, like from the use case point of view, okay, this particular map that you're creating is for even specific application for transportation. Can you just briefly explain like how this map is going to be used in AVIN's testing environment, the network they're putting in place? Because all these ADs, like autonomous drive uh, cars, they have their own maps, right? So if, for example, forget Google Maps, for example, of they have you know, acquired some map from somewhere. So if it's closed down, like how this map is going to be used, integrated into that car, and how it's going to be useful for Waterloo region, for example? Well, I, I would, the first point I would challenge in terms of the data already exists, you'd be, sho you'd be shocked to how geocoding is not necessarily actually, your point A to point B and your lat longs for each address I mean, I, I think, have you ever had an Uber drop you off in the wrong place? I, I, the, this, this data that everybody uses is actually not as accurate as you necessarily would think. So it's very important to go back out and to actually recreate a, a more thorough, um, double-checked version of all of the data. Um, some of these transportation network data that you might be using is from aerial imagery that was taken five, six years ago that I, even everybody here knows how much changes have occurred even just along major routeways, if you're going, uh, even if you're traveling to Toronto, you've seen, you've seen all the transfer, transformation that has taken place um, in terms of the road networks here. So that, that, I would say, is point one, is it's just making sure that you have actually the most up-to-date, uh, correct view of the area. And then number two, I, I mean, I think it, it's really we want to build it, and then there's a number of different ways that we can have the AVEN community be involved. So I think re really what we're trying to push to is to have this be the test bed and then to also build out other areas that do have vehicles on the road, right? So, and I think, I think Moro can help this with is some of the future AVEN pieces. You got it? Yeah, so with respect to that, um, yeah, there are some, uh, for self-driving vehicles, for example, the Cadillac has a, uh, um, HD map that they've deployed, but really that map right now is such early stages. It's only of uh, major highways only. So in terms of uh, a map that a self, an autonomous vehicle could use to navigate uh, on its own, there are very few maps out there right now, and, and it's still a, a, a very new area. So this map will be of the kind of caliber and the quality that will support that autonomous vehicle driving within the entire uh, Waterloo region, so it's a test bed and an area for autonomous vehicles to try and use this map. Um, but yes, it, it is uh, one of the challenges that are being faced right now is that um, a lot of the automakers and a lot of the map makers are going out and collecting this data themselves and keeping it, as, as uh, Bill mentioned, it kept it in a proprietary fashion. So you have the TomToms keeping things in a, in a very closed environment, the Googles and Waymo keeping the data in a very closed environment. So each of these organizations goes through and actually has to do redundant work because they're collecting data that another organization has collected already to build an HD map. The concept for this map is that it's going to be more open in that its, its contributions can be made by uh, partners, uh, therefore allowing uh, a more efficient way to generate the map in, in the long term. Yeah, really trying to scale that out because again, like you said, there's a lot of duplication of efforts, but then really to get to all the nitty gritty details you need, it takes a long, a lot of hard work and really we want to build something that's successful here that I think we can scale, right? And so that's what we really, and there's, it's a lot of roads, so <laughs> it's, it's a lot of hard work. Is there any thoughts to integrate the 311 system of reporting potholes and other is infrastructure issues to either automatically update or highlight an area that needs updating? That's a, it's a great piece. So, I, I mean, I think that's another application. Like, the, if you really start to sit down and think about it, and that's why we love to have these presentations with your teams, is we want people to be able to develop systems that have those immediate feedback loops, right? It's 
if we have the road network out there and you want to go out there and take a photo of a pothole because it needs help, like there, there's something that needs to be, you have a lat long based on your phone, then you can, you can even be giving feedback to the government in a, much fa in a much faster fashion. That's just one example. I mean, there's, like you could be doing roadkill, you could be doing anything. There's, there's a lot of different things that you could be putting on top once you can add transactional data, health data onto a really thorough um, base map. And so really what we want to try to have is a situation where everybody's using this one pane of glass, I would say, this one sort of centralized view, and then you can be building applications on top of it. Yeah, and just to add to that a little bit, uh, there's an organization within Ontario called the Ontario Good Roads Association, and they have uh, been working with a, a startup called Transnomis, and uh, they're working on a map called Macavo. I uh, can't remember what the acronym stands for at this moment, but uh, the idea is uh, they have tied into the municipalities within Ontario, at least, to capture information like their 511 information in terms of construction and such um, and lane closures. And we're looking to, to them to partner to once the, the platform's fully up to integrate those two to kind of try and, again, share that information and make it more available uh, to, to the wider community. <clears throat> Regarding implementation, I just got an idea from a previous comment uh, that the, the reference map, you want to have a governance model regarding uh, the correctness of the data and to have that data um, solid so it cannot be changed easily. Have you were thinking about uh, implementation blockchain to put that map there? Because it offers the Im immutability, I mean, hard to change uh, feature, and also the blockchain offers the governance model uh, that's uh, more secure against a, a centralized, uh, compared with a centralized system. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's one of many different things that you sort of think about when you start to think about the security uh, of a system, especially security, uh, especially a, a system where input and feedback is always, is always gonna be very helpful. I think that's a little bit sort of two steps removed where we're going, but again, this is a very long initiative in which we're working with the AVEN team, and so we're always happy to have these kind of conversations because this is why we want to be out here and having and speaking to all of you because there's a number of different great ideas that can occur, and we want to be able to try to find the best system and birth it here that can be replicated all across North America. All right, last question. Uh, language support and complex script support. Uh, so uh, you, you mentioned that you're you're going global, or you've been, or you've gone global already. So yes, yes. So that's Thank actually you. one of the more interesting areas that we've like we're building out roads in Africa right now, and in any one country, a, a street can have five different dialects of what that could be. So I mean that goes back into sort of a feedback loop. It depends on the area. I think here. We are focused on North America at the moment, um, so it's a little bit easier for us to address that problem. Um, but I think that's something that we will be, we've started to try to address in some of our other projects internationally. Um, but especially when there's completely different kinds of languages and scripts and characters, that's something that we've, we're starting to look at. But again, it's, it's something that we haven't really had to address too much in our first iteration here in the Waterloo region. All right, everyone. Bill, uh, thank you once more for offering your time and effort to present today at uh, the Data Hub session and for sharing your insights on um, how we can leverage Ecopia's um, advanced systems to, um, on the road to uh, open HD maps. So we've put a little um, appreciation, um, token of our appreciation there. So thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you so thank much you. for taking the time. Yeah. We're really excited to give you guys this information. Perfect. So yeah, we're always going to be here. All right, everyone, so um, before we head off, I just wanted to let you know that next week we have a special Data Hub session, and uh, it's gonna be a slightly different format than our regular format there. It's going to be, uh, so Communitech and CG will bring together a panel of experts uh, to explore the uh, diverse challenges of tackling human trafficking, and uh, they'll shed some light on how that's actually affecting our community. So um, the event is actually on Wednesday, November 27th. The time is from 7 p.m. till 8.30 p.m. And that's gonna be at the uh, CG campus just uh, across the street there. Thank you all for coming, and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.